Um, so first, I just want to um, say I'm one of the three of the four organizers who is um, stuck at home and can't be there. Um, but I've been watching online, and it's been a fantastic uh, meeting so far. Um, so I'm really um, pleased with that. And I also want to say thank you to John for being literally the man on the ground running the meeting um, and all the hard work that you're doing um, on behalf of all the organizers. Uh, so with that said, um, I want to uh, uh, introduce our next keynote speaker, um, Jonathan Weissman, uh, who to this genomics crowd light, likely needs no introduction, um, but I'm going to do it anyway, in part because I'm such a huge fan. Um, so. After almost 25 years at UCSF, Jonathan has recently moved east to um, my neck of the woods, which is great, um, and is now the Landon T. Clay Professor of Biology at MIT, a core member at the Whitehead Institute, and still a Howard Hughes a Medical Institute investigator. So it's a homecoming of sorts uh, for Jonathan because he got his undergraduate degree, summa cum laude, here at Harvard. Uh, his PhD at MIT, and then um, went on to do a postdoc at Yale. So in his lab, uh, Jonathan investigates um, one of the main biological questions is how proteins fold into their correct shape and how misfolding impacts disease as well as normal uh, physiology, while at the same time building innovative tools for exploring um, biological systems from, you guys know this, right, ribosome profiling, lineage tracing, to developing CRISPR-Cas gene editing to regulate gene expression uh, in humans. So I think this is one of the most impressive aspects of Jonathan's research program is that he's tackling both fundamental questions in biology and also at the same time developing tools. Um, and to be a leader in both of those uh, arenas is uh, incredibly impressive. So he's won a number of awards, again, too many to mention, um, not only being a member of the National Academy, but winning the NAS Award for Scientific Discovery a few years ago, to most recently winning the Ira Herzkovitz Award from the Genetic Society of America. Um, he is also mentoring the next generation of scientists, some of whom um, are attending or presenting at this meeting. So with no further ado, uh, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Hopi, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me all? Yeah, great. And it's wonderful to be back here. So uh, this is very much a homecoming for me. So I've, uh, I've been to Cold Spring Harbor uh, many, many times. Um, some of you, most of you would not know this. I, my first time here was, I think, when I was about six years old, coming uh, with my dad to, to meetings. So. Uh, I won't even mention how many years it's been. I took a little gap between you know high school and college, and came back in graduate school, and have been here, you know, multiple times a year. But this is the first time back for me since uh, 2019, since the uh, CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR meeting, and that's a great chance for me to do a plug that uh, we're going to be having. I'm not sure which one, uh, the annual CRISPR meeting uh, in August. So. Uh, anyone wants to know how to edit these uh, genomes, come there. So I'm going to tell you today about some of our work, uh, uh, both uh, developing new tools for understanding the information encoded in genomes and how it's expressed in space and time, and uh, a few vignettes uh, that uh, illustrate how uh, we can use these tools to uncover uh, biological principles uh, in a hopefully systematic way. So. Um, it's, it's also a great year to have the biology of genomes, the, the human genomes coming of age. It was 21 years ago uh, that the first draft of the human genome was published. Uh, uh, and uh, just last month, uh, we got uh, the complete sequence of a human genome, the telomere to telomere nucleotide sequence. Although if you actually look in the paper, um, it was missing the Y chromosome. So that was either a little bit of poetic uh, license or it was published. Uh, Publication Day, a, a wry commentary on uh, the humanity of the male half of our species. Uh, but the, the Y chromosome will fall. And so, in some sense, uh, this is the end of an era. We really know to the nucleotide, at least for one genome, and we certainly will for uh, many more, uh, what the nucleotide sequence of these genomes are. Uh, by 
contrast, we're at the very infancy of, of understanding uh, the information encoded in these genomes and how they're expressed. But a, a critical tool in deciphering this has been uh, the CRISPR-Cas uh, technology. And, and the, what's so important to this is that now, even in complex genomes like uh, yours and mine, it allows us to uh, turn up, turn down, knock out, and alter in increasingly sophisticated ways uh, any gene or any set uh, of genes. And these, uh, in particular, have been uh, combined with uh, pooled screening technologies where you do things like make a lentiviral, what's now become sort of the standard approach of making a lentiviral library with a different guide targeting a different element in the genome, uh, and then uh, transfect these so each cell gets uh, typically only a single modification. You can then uh, uh, put a selective pressure, so for example, look for resistance to chemotherapeutic agent, and uh, at the end of the experiment, uh, count the presence of the guides in the untreated and the treated, and try to understand, and from that, understand how altering a gene uh, impacts the selective pressure. Uh, and then in sort of the, the next level of sophistication is you build a reporter, so intricately build a reporter that, for example, turns on a fluorescent protein in response to, um, in response to some biology you're interested in. So if you're interested, as uh, we were, uh, in uh, understanding how uh, the ER uh, acts as a protein folding chamber, uh, we hooked up GFP to the unfolded protein response and ER-specific stress response, and then identified all the genes that when uh, then when compromised lead to uh, dysregulation of uh, folding in the ER as evidenced by induction of this response. So these uh, uh, many, many thousands uh, of these screens have been done and the uh, enormous amount of biology has come from them. But they really have two challenges. Uh, first, it takes a lot of prep time to, uh, to build these reporter, and, and really the art is in building the reporter or doing the selection so that it pinpoints the biology, the predefined biology uh, that you're interested in. Uh, and then the second is, and really in a way probably more profound, is that at the end of the day you get these lists of genes. So you get most genes have no fitness effect and then some uh, will either induce your reporter or have a fitness effect. But of course, cells exist in a high dimensional manifold and uh, you could push a cell in, in uh, two very different directions, and when you do this dimensionality reduction through the lens of your fitness or your reporter, uh, you've lost that information. You've, there's no way to reverse it. You don't understand this process. This is not a, you know, a controlled UMAP. It's completely, it, it's not designed to, to not lose information. And so what you end up with is a long list of genes, and now increasingly those genes are true. So unlike some of the early days when you would do, you know, RNAi-based screens and half of the time or maybe more, they'd be due to off-target, you'd really believe that perturbing this gene gives you this phenotype. You just have no idea why, and then you, it's, uh, it's sort of a PhD thesis to figure out uh, each gene. Uh, this motivated us and uh, several other labs and uh, what was a wonderful collaboration uh, with Aviv Regev uh, to develop a pooled screen that then took advantage of single cell uh, RNA sequencing to read out uh, the transcriptional response in high di a high dimensional phenotype uh, uh, in response to doing an alteration. And the basic idea was to, as with the pooled uh, screens before was to put a guide in each cell, but now you do a single cell, uh, uh, make a single cell RNA seq prep, and the trick was that uh, so all the RNAs from individual cells were marked by a barcode, but in addition to getting the transcriptional response in each cell, you also were able to identify the perturbation, the guide RNA, and in this way you could do a, a pooled screen that would map out where uh, the per what the perturbation was and where it was pushing you in this high dimensional manifold. And we and others have now applied this to a very broad range of biologic problems, including uh, um, a nice, a very nice uh, paper from uh, uh, Marco Hein, uh, who's in my lab, it's now in Vienna, uh, studying, for example, the, how uh, uh, the host and the CMV genes alter the viral uh, propagation. Uh, and, but in our studies and in pretty much everyone else's, uh, these, we, this general strategy was to 
because of the scale that you could do perturbseq was to do a screen ahead of time. So for example, do a screen for genes that affected CMV propagation and take the couple hundred best hits and then use the perturbseq as sort of a high resolution lens to look at those, that, how the list of those genes worked. Uh, the, the problems with that is you then, again, had to, ahead of time, predefine the biological question that you were getting at. So it, it was going to be a long slog to really get broadly um, at, at all the different types of biological problems. And it, you didn't know what you didn't know. So it was not in sort of a, a great discovery tool or an optimal discovery tool. And we reasoned that because what's so important when you do these perturbseeks is to compare um, one gene to another one, that the cost of doing them grew linearly. If you do 200, it costs twice as much as 100. But the information grows as n squared because you go from one 10,000 combinations to 40,000 combinations. So it's really uh, made more sense to do this at scale. And uh, Joseph Replogel and uh, Britt Adamson, uh, Britt is, uh, was a postdoc in the lab, is now uh, 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 assistant professor at Princeton, and Joseph uh, is, was an MD-PhD student who's recently gone back to the clinic, built a lot of foundational work sort of over the beginning of the, uh, of the pandemic to uh, allow us to scale this up. And this allowed uh, Joseph and uh, Ruben Saunders, another graduate student in the lab, uh, to do uh, to do genome-wide uh, perturb seeks. So we uh, did this in every expressed gene in the uh, BCR able uh, leukemia cell line, K562, and then all the central genes in uh, four other cell lines. At the sort of most basic level, what you get from this uh, type of screen uh, is um, you take all the cells that have a given perturbation, so all the cells that are, say, knocking down HSP70, uh, and uh, average them, and then get the transcriptional response for each of these perturbations, for each of these genes that you turned off or on or, or mutated. So for example, if you knock down HSP70, you see predominantly that you'll get a heat shock response, or if you knock down uh, a mitochondrial gene, you get predominantly an uh, integrated stress response. You can then, in a, a Un in a, uh, do a, a basically an unsupervised clustering on the gene, uh, the expression responses, and from this uh, uh, derive all the different transcriptional profiles. And these, uh, in a principled, un unbiased way, undirected way, allows you to sort of rediscover the integrated stress response and the heat shock response and the unfolded protein response, as well as uh, a number of responses for many responses for which we don't have a name. The other way to look at this, and I think even more informative, is to take for each genetic perturbation, so if I'm knocking down HSP70 or HSP40, uh, take the transcriptional response as a high resolution phenotype. You might not understand anything why one gene went up and one gene went down when you perturbed that, uh, perturbed expression of HSP70 and HSP40, but if HSP70 and HSP40 cause a very similar transcriptional response, it's very likely that their loss is having doing the same thing to the cell, and therefore that those two genes are acting in a similar pathway. In this way, it lets you group genes by their function, again, in an unbiased way that doesn't require you to any way predispose, you know what all the cell is doing. And uh, these get you, give you really very rich information, and I'm going to just spend a little time blowing up uh, uh, this unpacking this a little bit. So here we do uh, the correlations of transcriptional responses of one perturbation to another. Of course, on the diagonal, it's all one because that's just correlation with itself. But the data, when you uh, then cluster it, uh, and we, we do this in a number of ways, but in some ways, just a simple hierarchical clustering of heat maps is a, is a nice way to display it. Uh, so you now, uh, you can blow up a little region of this, and you can see there's really a great deal of substructure, and even blow up a sub-region of this, and you see that there's, again, these sort of clusters of similarly acting genes. Now when you put your names on them, it's really very satisfying. So here you get the COP9 signalosome, this is netylation machinery, elongator complex, DAGA complex, and integrator complex. And uh, basically what we're able to do is, uh, with, is recapitulate thousands of known relationships and predict 
uh, and then uh, through work that uh, Ruben Saunders led, uh, uh, validate uh, new genes for functions uh, in many different diverse processes like ribosome biogenesis, transcription, and mitochondrial respiration. Uh, the other thing this lets you do is uh, dissect large protein complexes. So in a really elegant example, the integrator, which is a multi-protein complex, is very extensively studied. So, so a, a metazone specific transcription of vertebrate-specific transcription response uh, element, uh, the, uh, see, you saw that different proteins within the integrator uh, cluster together, but away from each other, and then uh, in this way assign, uh, mapping this on the structure, assign different functions to different uh, sub-modules uh, sub within this complex, and it, as well as identify uh, a novel component that uh, had missed uh, characterization. So in a sense, this was what we hoped for going in, that, you know, that we would be able to get expression networks, we'd be able to get uh, gene functions. In some ways, it's, it's similar to how one might use depth map uh, to uh, to uh, coessentiality, to cluster genes, or uh, protein complex data to cluster genes. Uh, and that was very satisfying, and I think, um, you know, a, a highly valuable endeavor. But what I'd like to spend the rest of this part of the talk about is something that I think is actually a much more profound use of this, which is that you can then go in because you have this very rich uh, sequencing information that's much more than just expressions that we've heard about, how you can look at introns and exons and variant, um, and I'll show you uh, other types of information that you can get, that you can then computationally, so instead of building a reporter um, with a GFP and putting in a cell, you can computationally build a reporter. And now in silico, you can screen uh, for that phenotype and get out uh, the behavior, the genetic basis of it, and understand even something about the mechanism. And I'd like to, I'll, I'll tell two stories about this, one about aneuploidy and chromosome instability, and the other one about uh, the logic by which a mitochondria communicate with the nucleus. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the chromosome instability, and I have to say this was uh, a, a, a really a, a favorite of mine. Um, uh, for sad reason, which is my colleague and friend, uh, Angelica Amon, really pioneered uh, the study of aneuploidy, understanding uh, that, um, uh, basing on some fact that uh, a hallmark of cancer is that their cells are aneuploid, they can't reverse this, so she was very interested in what were the cellular responses to aneuploidy. And uh, uh, Joseph, uh, brother, John, was uh, a graduate student with Angelica, who sadly, at, uh, in October 2020, uh, passed away from, at a young age from cancer. So it's nice to be able to, in a small way, uh, carry on um, the baton on this. So we got into this um, uh, by uh, being interested in the single cell nature of this. So everything I've shown you has been ensemble averages. We take the 200 or so gene cells, which have knocked down for each gene, and do an average so we get a better signal. But uh, we know that in addition to this ensemble averages, that there can be cell-to-cell -cell variability, and that taking an average uh, can obscure a lot of information. So I, I'll, I'll do one slide. I, I'm not sure it's the most relevant. Um, uh, and I actually borrowed it from a former student, Sylvia Ruskin, who's now uh, assistant professor at Harvard Med School. And, you know, I will say I'll do it for no other reason that it will be the one slide you'll remember from the whole talk. Um, so in 1985, the average starting salary of a geography major uh, from UNC was 130000 I think UNC is a good school. It's 1985, 130000 is a pretty good salary. So what's going on? Uh, you see there were um, nine. Uh, eight students who made sort of just north of 10,000, and one that was a million, and that was uh, Michael Jordan. <laughs> so uh, ensemble's averages can, can obscure uh, the, the truth of what's going on. So we, uh, and I should say we is uh, really Tom Norman, who uh, is uh, been our collaborator, is now assistant professor at, um, and so Tom, uh, and Britt Adamson uh, developed the perturb-seq method when they were in lab, and Tom is now an assistant professor at Memorial Sloan Kettering and did all this, uh, all this analysis a, a, as an independent investigator. So Tom developed a, a basically an algorithm that took the single cell uh, nature of this and looked not what the overall 
impact of the perturb average impact of the perturbation was, but what the variance was. And this sort of shows you that you can have some genes where there's very little variance, uh, and other genes that the mean would, uh, variance would be the same, but uh, do that because they have a very different cell-to-cell uh, -cell variability. You might think, you know, if you think about this for a moment, you think, well, that's probably because some guys are lousy, and in some cells are work, they knock down the gene, and some cells they don't, and that causes the variability. But because we're using CRISPR interference, which knocks down the expression of the gene, we can ask, are the cells that are not responding not responding because the gene wasn't knocked down, or were the, or, and these, the gene was knocked down, or is the level of knockdown in the, in the non-responding and responding cells the same, and there's something more interesting biologically going on? And the answer is, for some cases, there's a problem with the reagent, and we were able to exclude those. But for the large majority, that this noise, this variability, represented something about the biology. And for some of these, uh, we're still trying to figure out why they cause a variable response, but for a subset of these, uh, what we uh, noticed is that they were genes that were important uh, for chromosome segregation. And we hypothesized that the noise was because the underlying defect was that chromosomes were missegregating, but which chromosome and which cell missegregated was random. So there would be a different res transcriptional response depending on whether you lost chromosome 6 or gained chromosome 16. And fortunately, you might say, all right, that's great, but where do you go with this? Fortunately, uh, we knew uh, from uh, work that had been done in the field, uh, in particular this uh, paper from 2014, that you could use single cell RNA seq data to study aneuploidy. The basic idea is that if you had a cell that's aneuploid and the genes are in a random order, you'd see some genes go up and some genes go down. But if uh, they had lost chromosome 2 and you order the genes by the chromosome, what you'll see is uh, for other chromosomes, there sort of be random things going up and down, but for chromosome 2, across the chromosome, you'll see a depletion of the genes by roughly a factor of 2 because they have only one copy of the gene instead of 2. So in this way, in a single cell basis, we can judge uh, the aneuploid state. And what we saw is uh, in a non-targeting, uh, if we don't target any gene, and we, each one of these is a cell in the expression pattern, it's just sort of random noise. But when we knocked down a TTK, one of those very noisy genes, this is a, 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 check, a kinase involved in a spindle pole checkpoint, now uh, we see that some of the cells lost chromosome 1, other gained chromosome 1, other cells lost chromosome 2, et cetera. So this really did sort of validate our hypothesis that the source of the noise was that although there was under one single underlying molecular defect, the tendency to gain or lose chromosomes to become aneuploid, that which chromosome you gained or lost was relatively random, and the transcriptional response to gaining or losing different chromosomes was different. So when you look at the level of, of a single cell RNA-seq, you see this high variability. This also, because, and this is what I mean by we can now create this synthetic phenotype based on the propensity to gain and lose chromosomes, something that would be very hard to design a single reporter for because you have all these different chromosomes and how would you know which ones you gained and lost. But in silico, this is very straightforward to do. And then we can now do a genome-wide screen uh, for the propensity to, uh, to gain or lose chromosomes. And what we found was uh, that uh, in K562, a highly aneuploid cancer cell line, an RPE1, a non-transformed, immortalized, uh, nearly euploid cell, uh, that there's very good correspondence between the genes, the SIN score, which measures uh, basically the, the aneuploidy propensity. There's very good correspondence between uh, the genes that were important uh, for uh, modulating aneuploidy in RPE1 and K562, and then when we uh, put these, the function of these, it's sort of a who's who in uh, chromosome segregation, uh, things involved in spindle and centrioles and uh, cell cycle regulation, centromeres and uh, DNA repair, and then a few others. Uh, but importantly, only a subset of these, showing that these were really the critical modulators of uh, the ability to uh, robustly segregate the chromosomes. So one of the reasons that we're excited about this for the biology of aneuploidy is that now we can really catch cells in the act uh, of losing or gaining individual chromosomes. So we can understand, you know, how, so this, what is the immediate response, general, generic response to being aneuploid or chromosome-specific response? Are there global karyotype-dependent cellular stresses? 
uh, are there karyotypes that are favored in their formation or selected uh, immediately after doing this? All right, so I'm going to go on now to the second, um, the second vignette, second and last vignette from this part of the talk. And this is uh, our insights into the logic by which uh, mitochondria uh, are signal uh, stress and that the nucleus in the cell responds to this. So as you all know, uh, mitochondria are endosymbionts. Uh, uh, um, they have a bacterial origin, uh, but uh, slowly over time, they've lost the vast majority of the genes. So uh, something 99 plus percent of the, of the proteins that are uh, localized in mitochondria, uh, those genes have migrated into the nucleus and the nuclear, they're expressed in the nucleus. So they then are turned on by sort of normal transcription, translated in cytoplasm, and then delivered as a protein into the mitochondria. But there's still uh, a handful, in, in case of humans, uh, 13 genes uh, that are uh, encoded by the mitochondrial genome, translated by ribosomes in, inside of the mitochondria. And why you know, mitochondria would lose 99% of the genes and not lose the last uh, 13, which would have allowed them to give up having to make mitochondrial ribosomes and all this extra machinery is really, uh, I think, a, a major open question in cell biology. So uh, we've perturbed all the nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes because we perturbed all the expressed genes. And what we now asked was, uh, as we uh, turned up and da turned down uh, different uh, functions in mitochondria, uh, this must transmit a signal to the nucleus uh, that sensed induced transcription and, and responded to. So we wanted to understand uh, uh, how uh, these different defects in mitochondria are sensed by nucleus and how the nucleus responds to uh, uh, through gene expression. And what we got was at first really rather disappointing. Unlike this, you know, intricate structure where the elongator and the COP9 signalosome gave clearly distinct transcriptional responses, basically to first approximation, any perturbation, whether it's to cardiolipins or to ribosomal proteins or to trans, uh, trans location into the mitochondria, all of these very different response, different bi biochemical proper functions of mitochondria, when you knock them down, gave a single uniform transcriptional response. And that response was this stress pathway that I've talked about, the integrated stress response. So basically, to first approximation, all the nucleus is doing is saying, the mitochondria are not working, I'm going to turn to ISR, which uh, is a massive stress response that turns down translation and sort of... Uh, um, but there doesn't seem to be any nuanced response. But as I said, in addition to the thousand or so mitochondrial, no, sorry, nuclear encoded uh, mitochondrial genes, uh, there's 13 uh, protein coding genes uh, that are encoded in the human mitochondrial DNA. And uh, when you do the single cell RNA seq, you, you pick up the these 13 mitochondrial genes, and although they're only 13, they're well expressed, and uh, we can measure them very well. So we can now ask. What if we clustered the uh, thousand or so nuclear encoded mitochondrial genes not on the nuclear response but on the mitochondrial response, so using only these 13 genes to cluster them? And now, as you see, there's much more structure. When you go into this, the structure makes a lot of sense. So it very nicely separates you know, the large subunit, the small subunit, import and quality control, ATP synthase, and the various different um, uh, oxfos complexes. And again, when you blow this up, you get this sort of intricate structure that recapitulates a lot of known biology and uh, allowed us to identify a, a new uh, component involved in uh, biogenesis, the ATP synthase, uh, which we and independently uh, another group, uh, John Walker's group, actually uh, validated. John Walker beat us by a, a, a couple of months. We got the results. and. The next, literally the next day, we see the John Walker's paper in uh, PNAS. I have to say, being beat by uh, John Walker, who of course won the Nobel Prize for his characterization of ATP synthase, uh, I, I don't feel too badly. Um, uh, so, this was a bit of a surprise, and the re that, that you'd get these different expressions of these 13 mitochondrial genes. And the reason why is the transcription of these genes is really kind of dull in that. It's actually uh, only two transcripts, one that uh, encodes one of the 13, another that can, so tw and then 12 of these, trans uh, of these open reading fives frames are transcribed on a single transcript. 
So there's no way for differential transcription uh, to alter the relative abundance uh, of these different genes in a nuanced way in response to the stress. However, there's an elaborate uh, processing, polydentalization, and degradation uh, of these different transcripts. And so uh, what this really saying is that it's all, the, it's all of these differential expression really has to be uh, post-transcriptional. And finally, I'll end this part with a little bit of uh, speculation or synthesis. What we're seeing is there's a, the logic to the uh, uh, response, uh, response to perturbations in mitochondria is that whether it's loss of ATP synthesis, large subunit, et cetera, uh, there's a uniform ISR activation nucleus, but there's then a stress-specific uh, response of the mitochondrial genes. And this is interesting because it actually allows mitochondria to do uh, something they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So you have a uh, typical cell may have a thousand different mitochondria. And if one is stressed in one way, another is stressed in another way, uh, they have to speak to the same nucleus. So this mitochondria would have no way of telling the nucleus to turn on some genes for me, this one say some genes for another one. But now basically what you have the potential of doing is having a generic nuclear response that sort of try to repair things, shut down translation, hope to survive, and then a mitochondrial, mitochondrial autonomous response by the internal transcription and translation of the mitochondrial genes that is uh, specific to the stress that that mitochondria uh, is um, feeling. So just a bit of speculation of how you can, I hope to open up a new piece of, of biology. So again, I, I hope to sort of you know, gave you a sense that you can really, uh, in an in a unbiased, principled way, start getting very rich biology. And I have to say, we did not think ahead of time that we would be studying aneuploidy or mitochondrial uh, stress responses. I would like to have said we were, thought we were clever enough to have done this, but really we just let the data, let the data lead us this way. And uh, we think, we hope that these will be, uh, for us and, and many other people, a great resource. And that, uh, and more generally, that these types of information-rich uh, readouts, and you heard a, a beautiful story from Britt Adamson, who on, uh, uh, worked, uh, did this repair-seq work to study DNA re response, that these types of systematic information-rich uh, phenotypes uh, will allow one to explore a very broad uh, biology, and even uh, do this in a, a principled, um, uh, unsupervised way. And so with the last few minutes of the talk, I step back a little bit um, and, and talk about a, a, another but actually quite related area so the, of the lab. And that's um, really what we're doing here, we and of course many others, are using the single cell technology to allow us to have each cell be a test tube. And then the trick is to make each, and so now you can do a million experiments at once at a single cell level. And so then the trick is to sort of make each experiment as interesting as possible. So, and then to be able to read out in the cell what the experiment was and what the response was. So we did this by perturbing, uh, di perturbing different genes in each cell and then looking at the response. But more broadly, uh, we, and I should say uh, many, several other labs, Jay Shindori in particular has been a pioneer of this, thought that you could go beyond this, that you could actually uh, record in a live animal uh, the history of the cell in its DNA and in a DNA scratch pad and then have these, uh, this recorded information be transcribed so then when you do your single cell experiment you'll be reading out the response the where a cell is, its present state, and the history that was recorded. In some sense, this is like a, a molecular version of a, the flight recorder on a plane, where you are recording what was the pilot doing uh, 10 minutes before a crash, and what was fuel like, and what was the altitude, and in that way have a much better understanding of the series of events uh, that led to an accident. So as I said, a number of labs have come up, I think, uh, with similar approaches. Um, many of these, but basically you need something to write into DNA and you need something to read it out. Uh, a favorite of ours and, and several others is to use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, mark the DNA by insertions and deletions uh, in a controlled way. Uh, a key feature of uh, the technology uh, that we've been pioneering is has very high recording potential, so we could, and we're, we're going to be, I'm going to talk about using this for phylogeny for family trees, and we could in principle uh, uniquely mark every cell in, in even a complex animal. 
The other is that we have a continuous in vivo recording over months. So as cells grow and divide, they continue to accrue these indels and these scratch pads. And this then allows you to reconstruct a very rich uh, phylogenetic trees. And then uh, finally, uh, they're transcribed so they can be read out. Uh, you can read out the cell lineage in the transcriptome. And just give you an example of uh, one, of the, one of these phylogenies. This is a tumor that's been growing in a, a mouse for uh, uh, almost two months. Those 5,000 cells, each of these is a cell, and then they're ordered uh, based on their phylogenetic relationship. And again, as you blow it up and then blow it up further, you see that there are really multiple different uh, indels uh, that were accruing over time uh, that support each of these clades and subclades and sub subclades. So you really can sort of see who is your who is your sibling, who is your uncle, who is your 15 cousin once removed. We had a beautiful introduction uh, to the power of this type of phylogenetic analysis from uh, parties who's, uh, who's used this uh, to study uh, both the evolution and the geographic spread of viruses. So you study geographic spread by looking at where variants are appearing and how they're spreading, but also, uh, as is illustrated by this uh, phylogenetic tree of uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, you see branches expand, like the Delta branch and then later the Omicron. Uh, and the fact that every new place it goes, it expands more rapidly, tells you that the the ability of this virus to spread more rapidly between individuals uh, has changed and lets you link this uh, change to the variant itself. So before you do any experiments, and so parties, I'm a believer, before you do any experiments, if you've collected a, an appropriate phylogenetic tree, you can be very confident that the, Omic the, the Delta and then later the Omicron variant has changed the behavior of the, tum of the virus uh, to make it uh, more readily spread. Uh, and basically, we uh, reason that we could use the same type of logic to study tumors uh, as they grow and metastasize. Uh, in a paper we published last year, we used this uh, by a transplant to study how a tumor metastasizes, how it basically moves uh, from one place in the body to another, in the same way that you study how a virus uh, is transmitted from one place to another. And then in more recent work, we've used this to study how you go from a KRAS uh, P53 mutation to oncogenic mutations uh, that we can introduced in an adult animal thanks to a uh, beautiful technology from uh, Tyler Jax's lab that allows you in individual cells in adult lung to induce these oncogenic mutations. And then we, we knew from their work uh, that these then go th over a period of months from a hyperplasia to adenoma to adenoma carcinoma, uh, et cetera, uh, in a way that very nicely recapitulated uh, what uh, the human tumors, can, can, uh, human lung tumors with KRAS P53 mutations have. But now, in much more detail, we can follow the evolution as you go from different transcriptional states uh, to uh, high plasticity states to an outgrowth, sort of your Omicron and Delta branches coming out that let you have aggressive tumors and to how these can get, uh, then uh, be the origin uh, of the metastases. And we can, uh, we can overlay uh, other oncogenic loss of uh, uh, tumor suppressor genes like LKP1 and APC and rerun the clock of evolution multiple times and see uh, how changing the genetics of the tumor alters its evolutionary history. And in this way, we think we can reconstruct uh, key distant and uh, rare events in the tumor in, in increasing uh, depth. So uh, just to finish, we hope we can uh, now apply this to study where resistance comes from, to understand using spatial approaches, uh, the relationship with the stroma, and then to record other molecular events. So for example, attack from the immune system or hypoxia. So with that, I'll, I'll finish um, and thank the people who did the work. I've had a tremendous uh, good fortune of having w uh, wonderful people work in the lab and wonderful collaborators. These are very multidisciplinary approaches uh, and really takes uh, multiple different people with different expertise to come together. So uh, Joseph uh, Replogo uh, uh, with Britt Adamson led the development of the expansion of the perturb-seq approach and uh, uh, much of the data analysis of the large-scale perturb-seq with, with Tom. And then uh, his partner in crime in all of this is Ruben Saunders, who uh, led much of the follow-up on this and is continuing this work. Uh, Michelle uh, Chan, when she was a postdoctoral fellow, she's now assistant professor at Princeton uh, with uh, Alex Meisner. 
Smith's lab and uh, Zach Smith and Alex Meiser's lab developed the first lineage tracing uh, to study mouse development. Uh, Jeff Quinn, in a wonderful collaboration with Trevor Bavona and Nir Yosef, did the metastasis work. And Dien uh, and uh, Matt uh, Jones, uh, in a terrific collaboration with Nir and Tyler, uh, did the uh, KRAS P53 work. So I'll end and take any questions. Okay, so thank you so much, Jonathan. That was absolutely fantastic. And we already have questions, so in the middle. So you mentioned having done this perturbation across several cell types for the perturb seq of all genes. How similar were the responses by the different cell types? And do you think there's eventually a way that we're going to be, be able to translate information from the cell types you've done it into other cell types as well? Um, the, the correlation, so if two genes have a similar perturbation indicating that doing similar function, that is very well, that's very well preserved. Not perfectly, sometimes genes are doing a different thing and different cell types are different importance, so the moon laying function, for example. But in general, the rule is those are very preserved. However, the underlying transcriptional response that's driving that similarity can vary from some cell types to different cell types. And I should say, we've really, We've sort of analyzed the K562 and the RP1 data. We're really sort of just digging into the, the, the other data sets to really do more of this comparative analysis. Hi, Jonathan. That was a beautiful talk. I have a question. You might have alluded to this in the aneuploidy part of your talk, that you should be able to infer the fitness cost of the different chromosome duplications, at least in the context of the knockdown. Um, and what about, is there any evidence that chromosomes are gained and lost at different rates per chromosome? And can you, do you think you can disentangle that? So I think we should very well be able to disentangle that. So we can either, um, there, are, there are drugs that you can use that would uh, promote aneuploidy, or we can do a pulse knockdown because it's CRISPR, it's reversible. So we'd like to sort of give an, a quick impulse that promotes uh, gain or loss, and then, you know, within a cell division or two, look at the abundance of uh, a gain loss of different chromosomes, the immediate transcriptional response, and then as you pass with time, uh, do, how, does that, how does that change? So that gives you the forward rate, I mean, you have to do the right time course, but in principle, you should get, be able to see the forward rate which chromosomes are gained and lost, and then the um, and then the selective pressure on the cells that have gained and lost those chromosomes. So I, I might ask a question. So when you have a CRISPR screen and you're looking at a stress response, the cells are very stressed, how do you disentangle the cells signaling to one another from the actual um, perturbation? And particularly in the mitochondrial work, because I can imagine these are very stressed and unhappy cells. So is some of the correlation, because at the, the nuclear genome level at least, related to the fact that there's just a lot of signaling going on and they're talking to one another, and that's why there's less signal than you might have expected. So we, we are using, um, it, those were predominantly in K562, K562 so we, but we also did, saw similar things in RPE1s. But K562 are suspension cells, so they're sort of average, they're, they're very rapidly becoming uncorrelated with their neighbors. And remember, the vast majority of cells don't have perturbations in the mitochondria, so the vast majority, and those cells are not responding. But this is predominantly about cell aut autonomous responses, and we sort of designed K562 are sort of our yeast because they're in suspension, and um, and so their, their uh, environment is average very rapidly. Um, Really what I think is that this, this should now be done in a spatial, by spatial readouts. Um, so now you can start to see if I perturb gene cell A, what is its neighbors doing and get nearest neighbors effects. And so it's, it's huge. So I, I think these data sets are, are perfectly capable of, of um, being collected. Uh, fully analyzing them is going to be a challenge. Absolutely. Other questions in the room? So in the functional dissection of the mitochondrial biology, and uh, you mentioned that like taking the correlation across those like uh, 13 genes is going to be you know informative to reveal the fine structure. Do you think in other contexts of biological phenomena, like not only computing the correlation across all the genes, but focusing on 
subset of gene that captures the types of biology you are interested in going to be a, like a generally useful strategy to you know reveal the substructure yeah people. so for sure and, and beyond just um, the transcriptional responses so for example in work I didn't talk about one of the things we did was use this as a splicing so we heard um, uh, from Leo about that you can uh, look to look at different variants so we can now look at how perturbations change the abundance of different variants or globally change uh, differences in splicing or we can look at reactivation of retrotransposons so basically anything you can pull out of the sequencing data um, you can now develop either in a in a uh, um, hypothesis oriented way like we did with the aneuploidy or with the mitochondria or even in a, a purely data driven way you can get phenotypes that are just by uncluster by unsupervised clustering and then you don't even know what the phenotype is you just know it comes out as unsupervised uh, unsupervised learning approach and then you can understand the genetics of that unsupervised. Um, and I should say I've been really focusing on transcription readouts in part because that's what we can do well and it's a nice rich readout um, Alluded to uh, the repair seek that Britt Adamson has done, which was for DNA repair, looking at the variants of repair. Repair was a, a much better readout for getting at that biology. And then on top of this, there's been beautiful work from Zhao Wei Zhang and uh, a, a work I uh, helped a bit out with Ron Vale and, and most prominently uh, Paul Blaney doing uh, pooled image based uh, screens. And so that I think is going to uh, be very useful, uh, revealing things that are sort of. Uh, largely invisible from or hard to pull out from transcriptional responses. At the back there. I, I had a question about the, the scratch pad stuff you mentioned at the very end. So the analogy with the virus is interesting because like presumably in the viruses the kind of rate at which these things are coming in is pretty constant. So you have this kind of constant molecular clock introduction of these edits. Is How true is that in the scratch pad example? Presumably there's some kind of conditional dependence of the rate at which they occur based on what's already happened. Um, so, I mean, we, we're engineering them into, uh, you know, we hope neutral parts of the DNA. And uh, what could vary is the expression of the Cas9, and that could make it go, that could make indels go faster or slower. Um, and this gets to maybe, I'm not sure I'm entirely answering your question, but one of the things we'd really like to do is to have an absolute sense of time, so actually sort of build a counter that would count every time a cell divided, or sort of a clock. And you know, the idea is you would then know what, when something happened the way you know when the fire happened back when we had analog clocks because you'd watch the melted minute hand and if it you know, dip, exactly, yeah. melted at 210, that's when the fire happened. So we'd love to build a, a sense of a, a, a clock or time uh, in, in these. Um, you can also, there's some very nice work including a really elegant set of uh, papers from Jason Dory's lab that are on bioarchive. Uh, he calls it a ticker tape approach which lets you look at the order so you don't know exactly when something happens but you can say that A happened before B and B happened before C. I'm curious, um, based on what you've seen so far about tracking molecular events in cancer, um, from that data, have you has something emerged on how you might be able to change treatments to mitigate resistance, for example, ahead of time or combination treatments? What have you seen from that? Yeah, so in the metastasis paper, we, in a sense, this was, we thought this was like our, our simplest system, but it was a nice proof of principle. We worked with the A549, a long passage uh, uh, cancer lung cell. And what we uh, found uh, was that there was heterogeneity, not in how rapidly they grew, but in the propensity for these uh, uh, different subpopulations to metastasize. We gave a transcriptional uh, signature of that. We could show that this identified new genes that were driving uh, tumor invasion in an in vitro model. So that's a way we can get at sort of the molecular nature. Going from that to how do we target that, of course, is, is its own challenge, but it's a, it's a start. I would not do that in A549s, to be honest. I'd much rather do this in the autochthonous model, the Tyler Jackson's model, where you're introducing an otherwise genetically wild-type uh, wild mouse, the KRAS and P53 mutations. So we are able to also see signatures that drive uh, the tumor aggressiveness is a sort of equivalent of the Omicron and Delta variant. And when you take those signatures, you can see that in human patients who have high signatures of, of aggressive uh, that drive 
these expansions, they have a, a poorer prognosis. We're very interested, though, of going beyond that to try to understand sort of the signatures and metastasis, what the cells were doing, that from which the metastasis came, what state they were in, and uh, or uh, looking for the origin of resistance. So that's a long-winded way of saying I certainly hope so. But I don't have a great answer at the moment from the data we have. Uh, one final question, uh, so going back to the aneuploidy, so, so you showed like those uh, knockouts that are associated with high variance uh, seem clearly to be enriched uh, for, for that type of explanation, but I was just curious, is that really the universal you know, answer to, to, to those high variance response or do no. you have, you know, how frequently do you have like genes that you, know, you knock out show that huge variation and it, it doesn't seem to be explained by that? No. What? It's only a subset, so it's one that we could get a nice story on and you know understand. But then there were others that were clearly not working through that. And actually, even in the first uh, Brit and Tom's first perturb seek, they saw that when you knock down BIP, H the HSP70 in the ER, that uh, you were getting variable transcriptional responses. And you know we hypothesized that maybe whether. There's three branches of the UPR, maybe if stochastically, if one goes up first, it may take over, but we, we really have not disentangled what the origin of this variability is. Excellent, so please join me in thanking Jonathan again for a fantastic talk. <laughs>